Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Xiaobo Lu. I'm a professor of political science at Barnard College and the acting director of uh, uh, Weatherhead East Asia Institute this semester. Since its establishment in 1949, so we're almost 70 years anniversary. By the way, we're actually preparing to celebrate our 70th anniversary uh, next year. So I hope you're participating in the events. Um, the Institute has been Columbia's uh, center for research, education, publication, and events related to modern and contemporary East Asia and Southeast Asia. We hope that you will visit our website, wei.columbia.edu, to learn more about our public programming and uh, academic opportunities, and you will attend many of our spring seminar, uh, 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 semesters, lectures, and conferences and workshops. Now, this evening, I'm very pleased to introduce what is uh, our, one of our most important events um, each academic year at Columbia, that is the N.T. Wong Distinguished Lecture. This is the eighth N.T. Wong Lecture. Uh, for eight years now, the WEAI, the Weatherhead East Asia Institute, uh, has been the proud sponsor, along with the Chase Institute for Global Business at Columbia Business School. This lecture series commemorates the late Dr. Nianzu Wang, or Wang Nianzu, who served as director of the China International Business Project at Columbia University. Dr. Wang Nianzu understood the great potential for the Chinese economy and worked to promote greater understanding for the, developing, uh, for the development in Chinese international business relations. It is an honor to, has, to, to, uh, it, it is honor, to honor his legacy that NT1 Distinguished Lecture continue to provide internationally renowned experts on the Chinese economy with opportunity to share their work at, with Columbia community. So I'm very happy now to invite the Professor uh, Shang, Shang Jinwei, who holds the NT Wang Professor of Chinese Business and Economy at Columbia, to introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much, Professor Liu. It's my uh, honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Haiming Fang. Professor Fang uh, is uh, class of 1965, term professor of economics at University of Pennsylvania. From his CV, I also learned that he's also a professor at uh, uh, Wharton School, a professor of healthcare management. Uh, professor Fang uh, is a very creative and very productive uh, applied uh, economist uh, with very broad uh, uh, set of interests and very versatile uh, skills. Even though tonight he will be talking about the Chinese economy, uh, uh, within the profession, he's also extremely well known for his creative uh, research on discrimination topics, on health care, on insurance, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so on. So he uh, uh, has a very versatile skills, a very broad set of uh, uh, creative uh, ideas. For his research uh, on discrimination, for example, Professor Fang has uh, designed and implemented uh, various tests to examine the role of prejudice uh, in racial disparities uh, in matters involving uh, uh, search rates uh, during highway stops uh, and uh, so on. And, and for his uh, research on insurance and, and healthcare uh, topics, Professor, Wang, uh, Professor Fang was awarded the 17th uh, Kenneth Arrow Prize by International Health Economics uh, Association. Professor uh, found before uh, uh, joining or returning to uh, 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 UPenn, uh, he was on the faculty of Yale University and faculty of uh, Duke University. He was uh, a graduate of, uh, of uh, UPenn uh, some years ago. Um, uh, without further ado, uh, uh, let's uh, welcome Professor Fang for sharing his insight with us tonight. Thank you. Um, so it's um, it's my great uh, honor to uh, to come to uh, give uh, share with you uh, my research on um, uh, Chinese social security system. Uh, I titled this talk "Growing Pains in China's Social Security System," and uh, hopefully throughout the talk you understand what I mean by growing pains. So before I start, I would like to thank Shang Jing uh, to you know for a very uh, kind. Uh, um, 
uh, introduction. And uh, um, um, I, you know, my research has um, um, been kind of uh, broadly in the area of applied microeconomics. Uh, recently, I have been focusing on the research related to social insurance. Uh, I study uh, both areas related to the U.S. Uh, and uh, uh, the Chinese social security system actually is something that I have recently gone into. Uh, so it's a, it's a great opportunity to share this uh, work in progress with you. Uh, this is joint work with Zhang Yi, who is a, a professor at Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Okay, so, um, so everyone here knows what, uh, you know, Chinese uh, social security system is uh, undergoing some kind of financial stress, right? Um, and I, I here, uh, I would like to first present a few puzzling facts related to Chinese social security system. The so first thing is that uh, the statutory rate of contribution in China is very high. It's, uh, 28, it requires about 28% of workers' wages, right? So for every worker in China in the social security system, the employer pays 20% of the wages towards social security contribution. The worker pays 8%. Of its, work, uh, of its wages, uh, and uh, the sum is 28%. 80% of the workers' contribution is supposed to go to something called individual account, and 20% of the employer contribution <coughs> is, uh, is uh, in the form, just like the US, pay-as-you-go uh, uh, kind of system, right? The contributions collected from the 20% uh, the will be distributed as uh, retirement benefits to the current, uh, current retirees. But the 80% individual account is actually just a notion. So the government collects 80% from the workers' wages, in the, uh, workers wages and to tells the worker that uh, there is some individual account, uh, individual, uh, uh, account uh, uh, for them. Sorry. But the, uh, but the, the, the money is not really there, right? So it's uh, called a notional individual account, right? So it's a very high contribution rate, 28%. Um, the, the, the pension benefit rate is, uh, is rather low. I will explain to you there's a, a notion, you know, what, in what notion do I mean that pension benefit rate is low, right? And the demographic structure currently is still pretty favorable, right? There's still a lot of young workers for every retirees in China, but it's projected to get much worse very quickly in the next decade or so, right? And the Social Security uh, uh, Trust Fund is already in debt since 2014. So this is puzzling. Let me explain to you uh, uh, why, right? Um, so the dependency, population dependency rate in China, population dependency rate uh, measured by the ratio of um, individuals older than 60 divided by the population between 20 and 59, that ratio in China is one over, uh, is about 17.7%. It's one over... 5.65. In other words, for every uh, individual in China older than 60, there are about there are 5.65 uh, younger workers between age 20 and 59 supporting that retiree, right? And but uh, at the same time, the dependency ratio in the pension system, people who are actually paying into the pension system, uh, 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 in the pension system is uh, very different. It's only for every retiree, there's only 2.86 uh, uh, workers. Right? So in other words, a lot of the individuals between 20 to 59 are actually not working. So I will show you the numbers later, right? But even with, uh, so look at this, the in the population, if the population dependency ratio is 17.7%, the pension replacement rate, right, uh, a retiree on average gets about 50% of the social average wage. So the rep uh, this is the pension replacement rate is about uh, 50%. If you multiply the dependency ratio and the uh, population, um, uh, the, the pension replacement rate, uh, we should just, it should just require 8.7 percentage of contribution rate for the system to break even. But China, the, con the statutory contribution rate is 28% much higher than what would, have been, uh, what would have required for the system to break even if every worker, actually working age population is actually in the system, right? So this is one puzzle, right? Even if we were to use 35.0, uh, 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 you know, this one over 2.86 as a dependency ratio, in system dependency ratio, this number would just be ab around 16%, still lower than the 28% statutory rate. So how come, um, so that's one puzzle, right? So, 
uh, Chinese demographic structure is not uh, so bad yet, but system already is, is in, uh, in, uh, in serious deficit. Second puzzle is that um, in China, the, uh, the pensionable age, when can a, a worker start to receive pension, is very young. For male, it's 60. For female workers, it depends on whether you work in the uh, uh, public sector or uh, in private sector, right? So for the, pub for the civil service, uh, civil servants or uh, workers in the, uh, the uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, the female uh, pensionable age is 55. Uh, if otherwise, the female pensionable age is 50, so very young. Despite the very young uh, pensionable age, there are still a lot of earlier retirement. So people even retire before they reach the pensionable age, right? That's rather unusual for a developing country, right? So, um, um, so I will explain, so many people have been proposing that maybe China should raise the retirement age. Right? My, theory, my uh, uh, talk today will explain that it may not be a good idea. There is a reason for why those, uh, despite the very young pension of age, a lot of ma um, male and female workers are retiring earlier than they officially become eligible for pension. Right? There is a, so I'm going to provide a story, a, a story of why that's the case. Okay? Another thing that I should point out that when I said the relatively low pension benefit rate, in China there are actually uh, two different kind of pension benefit rate. Pension benefit rate is refers to uh, the ratio of pension benefits relative to some baseline wage. So official pension benefit rate is pension benefits relative to something called social average wage. Uh, for those uh, of you here who speak Chinese, 社会平均工资, social average wage, the average wage in the, in the labor market. That's the official uh, 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 pension benefit rate, that's about 50%. So a retiree on average will get a benefit that's about 50% of the average wage in the economy. Right? That's not very high. Okay? But there's another notion of a replacement rate. That's, this notion will be corresponding to the replacement rate in the US. It's the pension benefits relative to the pre-retirement wage that the, work, the retirees are getting. Right? It's the re replacement rate relative to pre-retirement wage. That actually is quite high. 74% for the high-income people and much higher for the low-income uh, workers. Okay, so I will show you. Okay, so, so I want to, uh, in this talk, I'm basically going to provide a story to explain, to a, a unified theory that can explain all those puzzles. And that, that theory will have implications regarding what kind of reform may be feasible uh, you know, going forward for China. Okay, so I'm going to uh, start out by uh, filling you some details about these puzzles, right? So first of all, this picture shows you dependence ratio of China versus OECD countries uh, measured in three different years, 2000, 2005, 2010. Each ring of the circle represents a level, 40%, 50%, or 60%. All these are the different countries. China is this one, right? In China, right now, in these three years, the dependence ratio is about 17%. 17% basically means that for every worker, the dependence ratio again is measured as the ratio of workers between 20 to 59, number of workers aged between 20 to 59, relative to uh, individuals' uh, population above 60, right? That's a, a, a standard definition of dependence ratio. In China, it's 17%, meaning that for every uh, individual older than 60, there are, five, uh, there are six um, uh, workers uh, between uh, individuals between 20 to 59 that can potentially pay into the system to, uh, to support the retirement uh, benefits of the elderly. Right? So it's still very young. Uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, demographics uh, structure is still quite favorable uh, for a pay-as-you-go social security system okay? uh, relative to other OECD countries. This, of course, will get worse over time as China, uh, as the impact of uh, one-child policy start to kick in. Okay? Now, this is the labor force participation rate of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, in China for those workers be between age 55 to 64, right? A Chinese male, the labor uh, oh, uh, between this age group, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the pa labor force participation rate is about 40%. Uh, the OECD average is 64%, right? For female, uh, the, uh, the, in this age group, the labor force participation rate is only 12%. Uh, the OECD average is 44%. Uh, uh, sorry, the OECD average varies whether you look at 2007 number or 2012 number, but it's about 45%, right? 
So here, basically, the question, the, the issue is that uh, the fact is that Chinese male and female labor force participation rate for the relatively old, 55 to 64, they are much lower than uh, the other uh, OECD countries. And if you look at the, you know, break down a little bit deep uh, uh, further, you can look at the, the, the data from the 2010 and 2000 census in China, and you can see that uh, for different age groups, uh, you know, male uh, labor force participation rate, uh, you know, is declining as you get older. That's not surprising, right? Uh, you know, 50, 75 for this age group, a little older, a little, you know, the labor force participation rate is lower. And if you get, uh, if uh, in the age group of 60 to 64, it's even lower. And male labor force, force participation rate is higher than female. But interestingly, between 2010, 2000 and 2010, both the male group and female group have, uh, uh, the labor force participation rate has been declining. Okay, so that's another thing that's interesting, uh, uh, that's important to point out. Okay. Now this is the benefit of retirement rate. Um, uh, in uh, the, this data, the CHOWS data set. CHOWS is China's Chinese version of the health retirement study data, right? Um, and this, uh, uh, we collected, this, in this data set, we, we can divide the workers uh, into different groups depending on whether their pre-retirement income is low, medium, or high. And uh, this 288.3 uh, says that for low uh, income group, for those workers, retirees, whose pre-retirement income is in the low income group, their pension level is actually about three times their pre-retirement wage. So it's very generous uh, uh, a benefit uh, replacement relative to the pre-retirement uh, uh, wage, right? For the high income group, you know, the, it, it's, uh, a, the lowest level is 70%. So in general, Chinese social security system is quite um, generous if you use the pre-retirement wage as the, um, as, the, uh, as, the, uh, as the denominator in measuring the benefit uh, re replacement rate, okay? Is it assuming the period time of income is correctly measured? Yeah, it's assuming it's uh, correctly measured. Is it literally period time of wage or total income before the time? Um, total income, this is the total, the pre-retirement total, pre-retirement wage income, wage income is being used in defining whether the, the individual is low income, middle, middle income, or high income group, and using the denominator in calculating these ratios, okay? And another, so the, this part will come to the uh, across of the story that I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell a story that um, in Ch China is very different from the United States in the, in the, in the, in the following aspect. The, you know, across different generations, of course, you know, when the younger generation will be more productive, than the older generation, right? But in China, this increase in the human, human capital uh, over generation, across generations has been much faster than what's going on in the US or in other OECD countries. And that is what I mean, the growing pains. So I'm, say, I'm gonna show that, I'm gonna argue that this, this mechanism that human capital, intergenerational growth in human capital in China is very fast, and that growth is responsible for all the puzzling facts that I described in the first slide, okay? So I'm gonna show you a couple of things to make the point that in China, the human capital increase over generations has been much faster than in other countries. Uh, first of all, this looked at the, the multiples of highly educated, meaning co uh, individuals with college degree or higher, among the young group, 25 to 34, uh, relative to the fraction of high, uh, college educated, among the old group, 55 to 64, um, uh, in different countries. So this is uh, for two years, 2006 and 2015, 2005 and 2015. In China in 2005, right, uh, the fraction of college educated among the, this age, 25 to 34, is about six point, uh, about seven times, 6.6 .6 times than the fraction of uh, highly educated among the 55 to 64, right? So there are a lot, a lot more highly educated among the young, uh, than uh, among the old uh, in China in 2005. But this ratio has been even higher uh, when it's measured, uh, it's measured in 2015, right? It's about almost nine times more um, highly, uh, college educated uh, and higher among the young group than, the old, uh, than uh, among the old group in 2015, okay? And this, of course, in China just stands out relative to other countries, right? It's uh, the closest uh, one is South Korea, okay? 
Now, what's the, uh, what, the impact of this increasing human capital growth of the young relative to the old will be reflected in the following, uh, so this actually is uh, the, change, the ratio of college educated of young workers uh, over college educated of older workers uh, you know, in different years uh, in China. So uh, this graph I just show two years, 2005, 2015, and this one shows over, over the years. So this multiple, right? The ratio of college educated among the young over the ratio of college, uh, over the college educated, fraction of college educated among the old is plotted for every year in the data, and this is, has been increasing. Okay. Okay, and the one implication of it is that the wage age. So if you look at the data, right, in any country you can look at the cross-sectional wage data and plot out the relationship between average wage and age. In the U.S., if you plot in any data set you look at in the U.S., you you plot out the average wage, uh, the relationship between average wage uh, against age. It's uh, gonna be inverted, you know, hump-shaped relationship, right? The peak in the U.S. in the last 20 years has been very stable at age 45, right? So basically, if you look at any, uh, if I were to make a survey uh, about the wage, I mean, maybe this is a, a wrong setting because academic wage <laughs> seems to increase with, with the seniority mostly, but in the, in the overall labor market, uh, the 45-year-olds have just the right balance of experience and uh, they are not so far behind the technology frontier um, to just have the highest average wage, right? Uh, and it has been very stable in the U.S. In China, there is also a peak if, if you look at the age, uh, uh, average wage age profile relationship. That peak is much younger in China than in the U.S., right? So in, the, in, in 2000, uh, uh, in, the, 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 in this picture, it's somewhere around 28 to 30. Right, so in China, 28 year olds in the economy have the highest average wage uh, than any other age group. That's only, so I have a different paper showing how the cross-sectional wage age profile can be used to make inference about the technological progress uh, 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 of different age cohorts. So the idea is that when uh, some worker you know, uh, uh, enters the labor market, um, you know, uh, if uh, uh, the, uh, the, his wage is determined by how close he is to the technological frontier, right? And uh, so, the, so the younger cohorts have the advantage of being close to the technological frontier. The disadvantage is that they are not very experienced, right? So in a country where the, uh, the, the productive frontier, the productivity of each cohort is increasing very fast, the trade-off is in favor of, you know, uh, the younger uh, cohorts. The experience is you know, is not, is, is, uh, is uh, the experience factor is kind of dominated by, uh, by the how close you are to the frontier factor, right? So this picture shows the fact that China has a, 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 this, uh, the hump age is around 28 uh, to 30, and that hump has been moving earlier, right? So this I showed only for the year 2014, uh, 2014 2015, using a China family uh, panel uh, uh, survey data. I have also used the chip data, China uh, household income program data, to look at earlier years, and the, 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 uh, the hump has been moving up, moving earlier ages, right, uh, to the earlier ages. So that's indicating that in China, indeed, different from the United States or other more mature uh, OECD economies, uh, one important feature that the productivity of each generation is increasing at a much faster rate than in other countries, right? So that's going to be basically the key mechanism that I'm going to use to explain all the facts that I have described so far, right? So uh, the traditional kind of expla uh, uh, explanations of these facts has been rather uh, piecemeal, right? For one fact, they provo uh, the authors might provoke an explanation, right? So one, for example, very popular explanation, uh, 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 explanation for some subset of facts is to blame the defects of the Chinese social security system. Maybe the pensionable age is too, too young. How can, you know, 50, 50 you know, this is, uh, actually, uh, uh, so I, I forgot, uh, uh, there should be, um, anyway, I will, I will show you later. So a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese uh, retirees are, you know, you know dancing, do something called a square dancing, public square dancing, right? They are very young, very energetic. Nonetheless, they are retired, right? 
And uh, so people say, well, maybe the pensionable age is too young. Why not increase the retirement age, right? So the problem we have is that if you blame the low pensionable age for some of the facts, the question is, why don't we reform it? Why do we encounter um, you know, huge resistance from the public about increasing the retirement age, right? Moreover, why are workers doing even earlier retirement before they reach, reach the pensionable age, right? So some of you might know family members or relatives who actually retired before they become eligible for pension, right? Um, and moreover, the, the labor force participation rate of the, of the, uh, of in the 50 year and older has been decreasing over time. What explains this, okay? So the story I'm gonna tell is gonna uh, summarize, it will be summarized in this, uh, in this uh, pretty intimidating uh, uh, figure, uh, uh, the picture, but let me explain uh, very quickly, right? So the key thing is that the human capital of uh, different generations is increasing very fast, right? Um, so the productivity of the young is rising very fast. The productivity of the old elderly is, say, unchanged, okay? Now, the labor market um, will put worker, young workers into, you will hire the young workers. Um, and imagine that the wages of the young workers will be determined by the, their productivity. So young workers will be essentially employed. If they are willing to work, they can find a job. The older workers, however, for whatever reason, they, you know, they, they, they the, the labor market for the older workers don't clear in the sense that they, they would require a wage that's higher than their productivity. Why? I will give you uh, some explanations later. That, the one possible explanation is that, okay, the elderly, if, they, if you don't pay them a, a wage that's somewhat higher than their, their productivity, they may feel that the, their, the wage they're getting is unfair. They will shirk. They will not put in as much effort in their work, right? So because of this kind of concerns, the firms who are thinking about hiring a, an elderly worker recognize that they have to be paid higher than the marginal productivity of these workers in order to motivate these workers. So in other words, there will be a wage compression between young workers and the older workers. The wage compression refers to the phenomenon that the difference between the older and workers' wages will be, le uh, will be less than the difference in the older and uh, younger workers' productivity. That's called the wage compression. So productivity of, uh, of older, uh, younger workers here, older workers here, that's the difference in their productivity. The wages will be like this. Higher, uh, older workers have to be paid a little more in order to motivate them. Right? So I will show you. Uh, this is the key mechanism. Right? So if older workers have to be paid, right, so older workers' wage will also be uh, higher than the uh, older workers' labor market clearing uh, wage. So what happens? They will not be all employable. Right? Some firm will say, well, I'm not willing to hire those older workers if they have to pay a wage higher than, you know, more than their productivity, okay? So in other words, the labor force participation rate of the elderly is forced to be lower, not because they don't want to work, it's because at this higher wage for the elderly, the firms are not willing to hire them, all of them. Only some fraction of the elderly will be, uh, 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 will be hired, right? So that, that, will, in, uh, that will explain uh, so as the eld uh, elderly, uh, you know, because of the, their wages are higher than the labor carrying wage, they will have lower uh, labor force participation rate, and um, that will lead to, uh, you know, uh, more retirees, more, more elderly not working, even though they, they can still work, right, and uh, re lead to a redu uh, reduction in the, uh, re lead to a reduction in the in-system, um, dependence uh, uh, ratio, even though the population dependence ratio is unchanged, okay? So this, I will, uh, this is the mechanism that, uh, that I will explain uh, next, then I will go, come to the third part in a second, okay? So, um, so the, let me just explain this uh, mechanism in words again. The productivity growth of a young generation is a key driving force of the model that I will, uh, I will briefly sketch. Uh, there is some form of wage compression uh, resulting from could have many different micro foundations for why there is wage compression, right? So one possible reason I will show you later, for example, is, uh, is the fair wage, uh, due to fair wage hypothesis. The elderly workers, the only way for them to be motivated is somehow if they feel like they are being paid 
fairly relative to the young workers. They don't, they, you know, they don't consider uh, the fairness to be the wage relative to their productivity, rather the fairness is defined as the, the wage they are paid relative to the wage that young, the young for example, are being paid. If I'm you know, uh, old and I look at the, my, uh, the, the young college graduates and they are being uh, paid more, I feel like, oh, how come I'm not being paid as much as the young workers? So I will shirk, not putting effort. So the, the firm recognized this would have to raise the wage in order to motivate me, okay? So for, that, for whatever reason, because of the wage compression, the old uh, workers' employment will be rationed in the sense that um, you know, the labor, the firms will demand fewer uh, older, elderly workers, right? And the, the, because of the, the labor demand, uh, uh, you know, the, the weaker local labor demand, um, the labor force participation rate of the elderly uh, results from that, okay? So the in-system dependency ratio will be high because many of the elderly they, that could have been working are actually not working, right? Uh, even though the population-wide dependency ratio is still low. And, uh, and, uh, and actually, the, the, the old, because they are now uh, spending more of their lifetime in retirement, in not working non-working status, they have to save more also because uh, they expect to be in retirement for longer periods of time, right? And uh, um, uh, the government, uh, I didn't explain this, I'll come to this uh, later, uh, the government will have to request a higher contribution rate from the, uh, from the, wor from the workers uh, because there are fewer workers working. They, 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 many of the young, uh, older workers who could have worked is not working because of the uh, labor demand is not there. Okay? So, um, so all these things could be explained by this mechanism. I will uh, share a little more detail later. So our explanation does not rely on the population aging, for example, uh, in a prolonged life expectancy or descending total fertility rates and so on. It does, does not re rely on the effects of the social security system. In fact, we assume that the social security system in China is actually totally welfare maximizing. Nonetheless, all the facts can, uh, that, uh, that we observe can be uh, explained by this driving force that the intergenerational human capital growth in China has been much higher than in other countries. Okay, so um, any questions before I go into a bit of detail about the mechanism? Okay, yeah. So um, uh, firms don't want to hire old people. Old people can hire themselves; they can be self-employed. Why don't they? Okay, that's a great question. So, so uh, Shang Jun's question is: you No, know, why don't? I mean, the the question is really: Why don't uh, the older wages? Uh, define a new uh, comparison group to the. Because the pension is very generous. So if you can get very good income when you are retired, you don't want to work. But here, you, you treat high uh, pension as, a, as an outcome of your story. Right, the right. got to actually reduce pension pay to give it to the high school early. Could, could that induce them to? Right, so um, I mean, my, uh, the, the story we are telling is that they, I mean, they could be self-employed now, right? But they are not. So uh, the, the, the story we are, we are telling here, okay, so actually self-employment is a... So, okay, right, so we, in, in China um, uh, right now, uh, if you, um, they don't lose pension, but there's no additional increase to, to the pension. So, right, so there's no, uh, if you work more, you can still get the pension. But there, uh, 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 what happens in, in, uh, uh, among the elderly, we, in the model, we, okay. Um, think about these uh, workers who are retiring earlier than the pensional, uh, pensional age, pensionable age, right? They could have continued working, right? So the question is, why are they, right? Uh, maybe, and moreover, this, uh, uh, earlier retirement than the pensionable age has been, this phenomenon has been increasing over time. So I, I understand there could be other explanations for why this is the case. What we are saying is we are proposing one possible mechanism through which that this may arise as a, as a perfectly optimal phenomenon. But I'm saying your story seems to have the assumption that old people cannot hide themselves. They have to depend on firms demanding their wages. Right, right. Um, Right. Um, right. So I guess we can build in that. Right now, in the model, we don't have it. Okay. Other qu okay, question. About the cross-sectional uh, average uh, among the age groups, mm -hmm. the average wage 
Mm -hmm. So, uh, do you have analysis like separate into private sector and public sector? Just curious, like the average amount of private sector, naively, I would say that relies more on the technology frontier than the right. experience. Mm -hmm. So, Right. So in the other paper, we definitely do this uh, by, uh, by you know, looking at uh, primarily on the private sector. Okay. So right. private sector is the same thing. What about the public sector? Do, they, do we see the same pattern as in the U.S.? That's a great question. So I, 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 don't, I, I don't recall these uh, detailed numbers, but I, I think we are more, so because we want to make sure that the, um, the wages reflect the productivity. So we are in the, in the in the study we have been focusing on the private sector uh, employment. So everything we have been talking about is private private sector, private sector. Oh, right, private right, sector. right, right, okay. right. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm wondering if your data is for all workers or urban workers or rural workers. Urban workers. Thank you. And I, I would just point out that that leaves out a very key section of the population. Right. So so, so all these discussions, I for, forgot to mention, all the data work is rec restricting to urban workers. OK. OK. So um, uh, so uh, uh, Sanjin warned me that I should uh, be uh, quick with the equations. Let me bri bri uh, briefly uh, illustrate uh, what, how the model works. Right? So um, economy is very complicated. We cannot really model the economy as uh, all its complexities involved with, the, with an economy, right? So we are going to write down a very illustrative model to just fix ideas, right? Imagine that uh, individuals work, uh, you know, um, the economy consists of uh, so-called overlapping generations, right? So the young generation, then the older generation. Next period, the young become old, then old dies. That's how the economy is conceived in this model, okay? And uh, the, the youth, uh, their time period will be normalized to one, uh, one period. So in the empirical work later, the, 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 the youth uh, period is between age 20 to uh, 59. Right? So that's uh, uh, 20 to 49, so 20 year, 29 years. And the old will be uh, from uh, 50 to 74. Okay, so the old period is, uh, time, is, uh, time period is T, right? And the number of young worker is uh, NTY in, uh, in, at time T. The old worker is NTO. And the population growth is just the ratio, right? The, uh, one over, the ratio of NTY over NTO. And the population dependence ratio here is T over N in the population. Uh, the dependence ratio in the population is T over N, right? Because they are uh, 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 T over 1 plus N, because the, the retirees work live for T periods. And they are, for every retiree, every old, there's one over n young workers. Right? So that's how, how we translate the, 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 the symbols in the model to uh, some terminology like population-wide dependency ratio. Okay? And the, 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 the way the, the, the labor market works is that firms combine workers' labor. Uh, this is youth labor. This is human capital of the youth. This is the old, uh, older workers' labor and the human capital of the old. Uh, there's some production function that maps the effective labor, uh, amount of labor, right? uh, number of workers multiplied by their human capital to some kind of exponent to create some output. And they have to pay wages, the older workers' wage, the younger workers' wage. Right? The, the human capital growth from the uh, older generation to the new generation, is, uh, this growth rate is G. G in, Ch in, in Chinese data is about 6.13% uh, uh, annually. Much in the U.S. is about 0.5 percent. So every year, uh, you know, the graduates uh, uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, um, next year's college graduates is about 0.5 percent more productive than um, the graduates of this year in the U.S. In China, the data tells us it's about 6.13 percent more productive uh, uh, for each new cohort. Okay, and we will show that this G, the difference, in other words, in China, G is 0.6113. Uh, in, the, in the advanced economy, it's about 0.5%. Uh, and that difference can explain all the puzzling facts of the Chinese social security system. Okay, so we, for simplicity, we assume that the young workers will always be higher. So their wage will be determined by their marginal productivity, and all the, all the young workers, the NTY younger workers, they will be exactly equal to the L, the no amount of the young workers being hired by the firms. So the labor market for the, for the youth exactly clears. Okay? For the old, for whatever reason, older wage, older workers' wage is WTO, it's related to the younger workers' wage. Maybe because of the, even though their productivity did not increase, 
they demand a wage increase commensurate to proportion, in a proportion to the increase in the younger worker's wage. The younger worker's wage increase is, is justified by the increase in their productivity. Older workers' productivity is not changing, but for whatever reason, they demand a higher wage to be somewhat related to the increase in the, in the younger workers' wage because of fairness concerns and so on, okay? And that creates a problem. So because the older workers' wage is, is no longer labor, uh, clearing the labor market for the old, so the, 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 amount, the, number, the fraction of older workers, LTO, the, um, uh, the amount of older workers, that will be hired, LTO, relative to the number of older workers in the economy. This ratio is going to be between zero and one. Right? Basically, basically, given the higher wages that the, uh, the firms have to pay for the older workers, they are not willing to hire everyone. Right? Because if they were to hire everyone, the marginal productivity of the older workers will be too low. Okay? So this is uh, uh, basically uh, the key story. So older workers are not working. The labor force participation of the older worker is lower than uh, is low because of the rationing coming from the, the fact that their wages, right, the, the, the older workers' wages have to be higher than the market clearing level for reasons related to uh, you know fair wage hypothesis or other reasons. Okay. Now, when the WT, uh, so WT, uh, moreover, this WTO, uh, sorry, PI TO, the fraction of older workers that will be employed will be lower if the growth rate of human capital is higher. So if every cohort, the productivity of younger workers is increasing at a faster rate, right, the, 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 the fraction of older workers that will be hired will be, lo will be lower, right? So China, from 2005 to 2015, this G has been going up, right? So if we go back to earlier, earlier picture, uh, this ratio of college-educated young over college-educated old uh, was 6.6 .6 in 2006. It, it's gone up to 9.6 in the uh, 10, uh, 80 years later, right? So we are saying G has been incre increasing over time in China. Okay, so when WTO, uh, sorry, PI TO is decreasing, uh, what's the, in the model, what is the, actual retirement age. Well, the youth, youth are working, so you know, they, they, their lifetime, uh, the youth time period is normalized to one, the, so they are working. The, the, uh, the, old, uh, the, the time interval of the elderly is T, but only the, those elderly are working only pi T O fraction of the time. So the retirement age, actual retirement age is one plus the youth plus the fraction of retirement that Reti uh, older age that they're actually working, right? So this is the actual retirement age. When that, that pi TO is lower, the actual retirement age will be decreasing as well. So pi TO will be lower as G increases. G increase will therefore results into a lower actual retirement age, reduction in the labor force participation rate of the elderly. What is the in-system dependency ratio? Well, uh, uh, um, the denominator here is the number of uh, um, um, uh, uh, workers, right? So the, all the young workers plus the older workers who are working. So that's the denominator, right? The numerator, sorry, uh, the, nu the numerator, sorry, uh, the numerator is a fraction of retirees, right? So they're NTO older workers. They live for T periods, but they are not. Uh, they are they are uh, uh, not. Uh, they are retired, trying to receive pensions with one minus pi TO fraction of the time, right? So this is the, the overall uh, in-system dependency ratio, right? And the population-wide dependency ratio is always T over N, so it does not change. But as pi TO in, in, uh, decreases, right, as, as a result of increasing G, this in-system dependency ratio will decline, uh, uh, will increase. When, when pi TO um, decreases, one minus pi TO will increase, so the, the in-system dependence ratio will increase as a result of, uh, of this mechanism, okay? So, uh, so that's basically the story, okay? Now, what, is the, what, what can potentially explain uh, uh, wage compression? So one thing that uh, in the model, in the paper, we'll be uh, proposing something called a wage, uh, fair wage hypothesis, but this is actually another potential mechanism uh, via SOEs. So a lot of the, you know, in, uh, uh, SOEs typically have uh, um, um, 
Uh, so there was a question about uh, you know, whether the hamper shape is, uh, is only for private sector or public sector, right? You probably have in mind that in the public sector there is a stronger concern for wage equality, right? So indeed that's the uh, idea behind here. So we, the idea is that in places where there are a lot of SOEs, the SOEs are paying a, a, a wage uh, to the elderly that's closer to the younger wage. They don't do uh, wage differentiation as much, right? So that will lead the private sectors to, uh, they, that will force private sectors to pay higher wages to the elderly worker as well, right? So indeed, we, if, we, if we every, every dot is a province, in provinces with a higher fraction of SOEs in the economy, indeed, the labor force participation rate of the elderly is lower. So in other words, in, in, in regions where there are a lot of SOE presence, there's a stronger mechanism for wage compression, raising the elderly wage relative to their, uh, their productivity, right? resulting into a higher wage compression, forcing private firms not willing to hire as many older workers as, you know, as they are in the economy. Right? So this downward sloping relationship between the labor force participation rate of the, of the elderly uh, with uh, the proportion of SOE in the economy suggests that the presence of SOE who have a stronger concern for equality, wage equality, might be a potential mechanism for the wage compression. Okay? But we are going to uh, uh, propose another story, another mechanism later. Okay. So finally, I'm going to uh, uh, come to the third part of this graph. Right? So imagine that you are a social planner, you know, the, um, the minister of uh, of uh, human resource and, uh, and uh, social security, right, that are designing uh, the social, uh, social security system in China. What are the key parameters of the Chinese social security? Well, it will have to, um, um, you know, it, it has to decide on the contribution rate, right? So the statutory contribution rate in China now is 28%, right? Uh, it will probably have to decide the pension number age. When will the individual be eligible to receive pension, right? So we are going to say that a social planner is actually trying to understand that uh, there is this concern for wage uh, the, the, the uh, force for wage compression, and is concerned that if they were to, um, when, if, uh, the, the, if the individuals were to, um, so actually, let me go this. So the, 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 the government will set the contribution rate, then firms and workers will decide on labor supply and demand, right? The government understands that a different level of contribution rate will lead to uh, a different equilibrium between firms and workers in terms of how long they will work and, uh, and, and so on, right? So it turns out in this model, um, um, uh, the, the social planner's optimal uh, contribution rate will be related to this parameter. It, it will be this. I'm going to uh, uh, skip this, uh, this, uh, uh, this expression and just explain, explain this, right? The optimal contribution rate will be related to this pi O, the fraction of elderly that will be working, right? So if pi O is low, the optimal contribution rate will be high for the, for the social planner, for the government, okay? And, uh, um, and the, um, uh, the optimal benefit repa replacement, replacement rate relative to social average wage will be related to pi O as well. If pi O, the fraction of elderly that will be working, is lower as a result of a uh, higher level of, uh, of G, the growth of human capital rate, the uh, benefit replacement rate relative to social average wage will also be lower. Okay? So uh, at the same time, the benefit replacement rate relative to pre-retirement age can be quite high in this simple model. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Uh, 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 right, so uh, let me just quickly summarize. Due to the high intergenerational growth in human capital, the, uh, you know, the, the elderly um, um, will not be working at a, at a high rate. They will, they, they will have a low labor force participation rate. As a result, the government will set a pretty high uh, contribution rate for the workers. They will ask, be asking the workers to contribute a higher fraction of their income toward the social security. The optimal benefit replacement rate relative to the social average, average wage will be low. Right? And the benefit replacement rate relative to the pre-retirement wage, however, can be still quite high, right? So that uh, kind of just allows me to kind of ex uh, explain all the facts that I mentioned earlier uh, in, uh, uh, in this framework. Uh, in the paper, I have a general model that endogenizes saving and so on. I'm going to skip this, 
right? Uh, let me actually briefly, so we, we calibrated the model to uh, the Chinese data, and uh, I'm gonna uh, show you some simulations to show that um, if Chinese growth, uh, human capital, intergenerational growth uh, of human capital rate is not 6.13%, if it has been a lower rate, what will happen to, uh, to the Chinese social security system and uh, labor force facility rate of, of the elderly and so on, right? So, as I mentioned, um, according to, uh, measured from the, uh, the cross-sectional wage relation relationship with age, we uh, calibrated that they, for each year, uh, the human capital of the new uh, workers is about 6.13% higher than the previous year's graduate, right? So that's 6.13%. And the uh, uh, U.S. is somewhere uh, about, about like 0.5 percent, right? So this, these pictures are uh, showing, right, as we vary this growth rate G from 0 percent to 7 percent, right? China is here, 6.13 percent. This, this panel shows um, how would the model's prediction of the labor force participation rate of the elderly change over time. This is uh, uh, the labor force participation rate. And this is the relative wage of old, um, uh, of uh, of um, of old relative to uh, to uh, sorry of um, of young over old, right? So the relative wage is on the right uh, scale is on the right uh, right scale, and the labor force participation rate is on the left scale. So it says that if uh, at six point one three percent, the model predicts that uh, the labor force participation rate of the Chinese elderly will be about twenty. 6.7%, right? But if the G in China is not 6.13%, instead it's 0.5%, China's labor force participation rate for the elderly will be about 60% as well, just like what we observe in the OECD countries, right? In China, the relative wage of old, uh, young relative to old is about uh, 1.4 uh, 1 on average. If had uh, um, had, uh, um, had the, 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 the G been 0.5%, right, this relative wage of old, uh, old, uh, young over old will be about 0.7, just like what we see in the U.S. So in other words, if we are concerned about the China's labor force passing rate of the elderly being too low, a relative wage of young over old, old being too high, that is all a result of the G in China being very, um, a lot higher than in other countries, okay? Now, actual the, the second picture looked at the relationship between the actual retirement age and the G, and the contribution rate, optimal contribution rate, and the G, okay? So the, the actual retirement age in China um, is 54.4, average retirement age, right? At when G is 6.13%, right? According to our model, if we believe our model, if uh, the uh, the G is, uh, in China is like the U.S., 0.5%. The average retirement, actual uh, average retirement age will be about 64, 64 years old, just like what we see in the United States, okay? And the optimal contribution rate in China, uh, I, earlier I mentioned 28%, the statutory contribution rate, but um, many of you know that uh, the statutory contribution rate is applied on uh, often the base wages, right? So, uh, the effective uh, 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 contribution rate is about 17% in, in, in the data, right? So our model predicts that if G is 6.13%, the optimal contribution rate is 16.9%. But if uh, uh, the, the, uh, the G is lower than, is 0.5%, the optimal contribution rate will be about 8.5%. Uh, Uh, so like a benefit. Right. So, um, so, so um, right. So we uh, in the in the in the in the uh, in the empirical analysis when we do the calibrate we do the calibration we are not we understand that we, you know some of the we are we observe the. Wage, base wage income uh, relatively well. A lot of in-kind payments that the Chinese workers are getting from their firms, we don't observe them very well, right? So we are, we are everything is adjusted uh, relative to um, the base wage. This is related to my earlier question. Uh, 
question. Yeah. So the pension benefit rates is related to base wage or is it put to you said it's on the income. No, it's base wage. So two hundred eighty-eight percent. That the picture, the gra the figure, uh, the table we show is base wage, right? Relative to total income, it could be much lower. Relative to total income, it could be lower. Yeah, 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 yeah. Contribution rate is uh, um, so you, you are talking about the first slide here. Uh, so um, so here, um, as I mentioned, that the the say suppose that the dependent uh, insistent dependent rate dependence rate is about thirty five percent, right? Uh, the um, the the re benefit replacement rate relative to the social average wage is about fifty percent. To break even, this the product of these two numbers is about sixteen percent. So the Chinese system right now is, uh, uh, if it's you know sixteen percent, it's just is about breaking even. Okay, but you, I think your question is. Um, Um, because 16, so the, in the so in the data, so 28 percent is really statutory statutory contribution rate. In the data, when we are, when in the in the in the survey data, uh, when we measure uh, how much do they contribute to social security relative to the wages? Uh, uh, in, okay, so um, relative to the to the base wages is about 16 percent. So uh, meaning that a lot, the our average is about 16 percent. So meaning that a lot of workers, this is one of the things that people mention as a potential explanation, there are a lot of avoidance and evasion to participate in the system. Even for those workers who are, work, who are actually working, they are not participating in the social security system. The average uh, contribution rate of 16% comes from the total amount of social security contributions divided by the total uh, base wage earnings of all workers, including those who are not in the system. Uh, who are not participating in the social, social security system. Okay, so come back to uh, this, uh, uh, this graph, right? So again, this is uh, looking at uh, um, um, the replacement rate of, uh, 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 this is the replacement rate of uh, relative to the, to the average social wage. Uh, this is uh, this one, right? In China, at a six, uh, when G is about 6.13%, the average replacement rate is about 50%, right? But when uh, G is, uh, say, 0.5%, the model will predict that the average replacement rate will be about 60%, okay? And uh, the, the, this uh, square is the net pre-retirement uh, replacement rate, so it's the uh, benefit relative to uh, the pre-retirement wage net of the social security contribution. Uh, that's pretty high in, at uh, when G is 6.13%, it's about 82%. But if G is 0.5%, uh, is, uh, uh, is then the, uh, the, the benefit uh, replacement rate relative to the pre-retirement wage or relative to the social average wage will be very similar, or at about 60%. Uh, 60% okay? And finally, this picture look at the dependency rate in the social, in the social security system and how that varies with, uh, with G, right? So the population dependency rate really does not change, right? It's, uh, it's T over one plus N, that's a constant, okay? The, the dependency rate of the system in the, in, in the social security system, however, uh, will, be, um, uh, will be much higher when G is high because many Many of the, uh, the workers who are elderly are not working when G is high. If G is low, uh, the dependency rate will be much lower, meaning that there will be uh, much, many more younger w workers relative to, uh, to every retiree uh, in the system. Right? So the f last thing I will, uh, I will talk about is uh, you know, what about delaying the retirement age. So in this model, um, delaying retirement age is really not a good idea, right? because delaying retirement age uh, 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 would uh, uh, hypothesizes that, uh, presumes that when you delay, delay the retirement age, the elderly worker can still find a job. But in this model, the elderly worker are not working because they, their employment opportunities are, are, employment opportunities are rationed. Right? Uh, they, are, they are worried that, uh, the, the firms are worried that if you hire more employ, uh, 
more um, uh, elderly worker, their, their marginal productivity of the elderly worker will be lower than the wage they will, be pay, uh, they will, they will demand, right? So, it's, uh, 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 so de uh, delaying retirement age, you can implement a policy of delaying retirement age, but that will not increase in the model the employment of the elderly, yes? Right, so that's a great question. We haven't uh, done that analysis yet. Right, so, um, um, and also the, the question of, you know, um, why, uh, should the, so, you know, why would there not be um, different kind of employment opportunities emerging to hire the older workers? Um, yeah, we haven't addressed these, cons these issues in this, uh, in this uh, project, right? So, um, so in our, the, 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 the punchline is that, you know, in our model, the low actual retirement age is a result of high human capital growth in China, plus some mechanism of, uh, that will lead wage compression. So, uh, you know, uh, the elderly are not working because uh, they are rushing from the labor demand side. So the, that's uh, explained the title of the, of the paper, right? The problems facing China's social security system is really a problem coming from uh, high growth of human capital over different cohorts. Uh, that's why we call it the growing pains uh, in the China, so Chinese social security system. So we did, uh, uh, if the government were to implement a policy of delaying the retirement age, uh, you know, it will lead to actually worsening of the social welfare. So I'm gonna skip some of the uh, details of uh, how much uh, will the social welfare be worsened because you know, after all, we are assuming that the current system is solving the social planners optimization problem, right? Um, so the contribution rate, the retirement wage, and so on, is, is, uh, our, we assume that it's coming from the, uh, the optimization problem by the social planner. So any deviations from that, including delaying the retirement age, will worsen the individual's welfare. And, uh, uh, and it depends, uh, so the exact degree, uh, extent to which the welfare will be worsened will depend on what is the kind of social safety net uh, that uh, the government will introduce um, between this, uh, 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 these two numbers. So here, uh, the, uh, the, the, the retirement age right now is given by this, right? If the government were to increase pi hat O, forcing the, the elderly to work a, work a longer fraction of their retirement period, the problem is that, that during the time period between pi O, the current uh, T pi O, the current uh, uh, time that the workers are working, and the T pi hat O, that period, you know, the, the workers are not able to find jobs. Right? Because the, the, the labor market can only handle this many older workers. If the government says, well, yeah, you are not working, but we are, we are forcing you to wait a little bit longer before you can get uh, a pension, so, the, you know, these workers depends on whether they're saving, how much they're saving, right? So it turns out that if the workers are life cycle savers, the workers will completely undo the policy change, by right? the delay of retirement age leading to no change in the welfare. But if workers are myopic, meaning that they are not planning ahead to, to, uh, to, to consider the fact that between T pi O and T, uh, T pi hat O, uh, they will be forced to, um, they will no longer be receiving uh, uh, wages, but they are not, uh, uh, not getting uh, social security either. In that case, um, you know, uh, uh, the government will have to put in some kind of social safety net program for the, for the elderly between their desired retirement age, their retirement, actual retirement age, and the pensionable age, right? So this, uh, the, in the picture, this is a new, different values of new denotes the generosity of this social safety net, uh, uh, social safety net program for this gap years between T pi O and T pi hat O, okay? And, uh, and, uh, but in any case, all these are positive welfare losses, uh, all these are welfare losses for the, uh, 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 and, and if, uh, if new is more generous, right? So more generous, less welfare loss. Uh, new is less generous, higher welfare loss, and so on. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this. To summarize, um, you know, this is a, a paper that tried to uh, use one driving force, I think, which is consistent with with, uh, with the facts in the, in, the, in the Chinese data. That is, in China, the human capital growth of different, uh, of, uh, different cohorts of the, of the labor uh, 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 of workers have been growing at a much faster rate than 
you would expect, or what, what, what we see in the uh, in a more mature economy, and that driving force, that, that increasing uh, growth of uh, uh, intergenerational growth of human capital, together with some mechanism of wage compression, that will lead to wage compression, compression will lead uh, to uh, a phenomena that we observe in the Chinese data, which is the elderly's labor force participation rate has been quite low, and has been actually declining over time as G increases, right? And that, and that fact that, uh, uh, can help explain uh, all the puzzling facts we mentioned in the first, uh, first slide. Um, and uh, um, you know, to, to, to conclude, right, um, the theory is built, basically built on two legs, the very high intergenerational human capital growth, and some mechanism, for example, the fair wage hypothesis that may lead to wage compression. And most of the problems associated with China's social security system is growing pains coming from the high generation, very high gener intergenerational human capital growth. Uh, the welfare implication of this model is that reforms such as delay, uh, delaying retirement age will hurt welfare because of lack of labor demand, meaning that the, work, the government can push the, uh, the delay of uh, retirement age. The only problem is that um, that will, will, will improve the situation only if there are firms that are willing to hire these workers. Maybe there will be. We, if we were to uh, model um, the, uh, the labor demand side more, uh, uh, more generally, maybe there will be some firms emerging to hire these elderly workers who have to uh, delay their retirement. But in our model, we, uh, 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 we don't allow for that yet. So uh, we are saying that reform to delay, delay retirement, age, uh, retirement age will only hurt the welfare of the, uh, of the individuals because they are basically forced not to be able to, uh, they, are, they are no longer eligible for a period of time, they will no longer be eligible for social security, but they have no employment opportunity either. No firms are willing to hire them, right? So our, uh, we feel like our story complements other explanations such as population aging or various defects of social security system uh, to, to understand uh, the bigger picture of what's going on in the China, Chinese social security system, uh, especially a set of puzzling facts that we documented uh, in the paper. So uh, that's, uh, that's all I have uh, for today. We have some time for additional questions for uh, Professor Fang. Yes, please. The microphone is coming to you. Sorry, thank you. Thank you, Professor Fang, for your presentation about this issue. So my question is that based on your findings, uh, instead of delaying retirement age, uh, do you think increasing the marginal productivity of the older workers by providing free or discounted vocational or uh, uh, technical trainings uh, to, uh, uh, and to uh, kind of like improve human capital at both sides of the equation? Right. Uh, kind of like a feasible policy initiative right. uh, to address this situation? Thank right, you. so I think that's a great question. So the policy implication from this paper is really that just purely a delay of the retirement age is not enough to deal with, uh, to address the social security uh, imbalance in China. Uh, the key is that there should be a combination of labor demand side policies, uh, for example, you know, um, uh, 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 retraining of the elderly worker, or any kind of policy that can facilitate the emergence of firms that are more willing to hire the elderly workers. So just purely delaying the labor, uh, retirement age is just is not going to help improve the matters that much because uh, in the absence of more firms willing to hire these elderly workers. The one way to address it is to make the elderly workers more productive or providing subsidies to firms that are willing uh, uh, that hire uh, elderly workers. So a combination of the delay, delay of retirement age together with uh, with the policies that are, that are facilitate um, firms hiring elderly workers should be the should be the uh, uh, should would be the policy implications of this this paper. Just just get it closer to you. It might it might work. Oh. Okay. Oh, that's yes. Good. Um, that was a very interesting paper. Thank you. And I think um, I've spent 17 years living in Beijing, managing businesses and in the labor market the entire time. And uh, certainly, increasing wage compression was one of the things that one observed over time. Um, and I I think the model is um, uh, very plausible. Um, 
But when you uh, think about older workers and the way the labor market actually works, they are almost never dismissed. Under current labor law, it's very, very, very difficult to dismiss an older worker. They leave when they want to. Um, and in that situation, one of the questions is why do they leave? And my experience in terms of middle class people working in Beijing and Shanghai, which is the two, the two markets I know best, uh, generally they leave because their wealth is not related to their wages. Um, and Yukon Huang, tell, who you may know, tells a story based on when he ran the World Bank in China of his secretary who had a very nice World Bank salary of $25,000 a year. She hit 50, her husband who was a civil servant, and she owned four apartments because they inherited from their parents, they had bought one themselves. Their estimated net worth is between three and four million dollars US. Um, their financial consideration has very little to do with the fact that you know, she was going to continue working for Yukon mm -hmm. at the World Bank for $25,000 a year. And I think that's true of, uh, you know, I, I can think of many, many people, and this is admittedly anecdotal, <laughs> but I think if you look at the transfer of apartments in urban, from, lost this, oh, here we go, from SOEs to individuals at a very low concessional rate, right. that was an enormous transfer of wealth. And it is playing a role in terms of their decision to retire right. uh, today. So I think that's an additional factor in terms of retirement. But I have another question for you. Yeah. The, the key issue with G is whether it will continue to be so extraordinarily high right. given the advances in the technological level. So I um, mean, uh, it's really uh, uh, the two great uh, uh, comments. Uh, the first comment about you are essentially asking about the role of housing, right? Uh, and uh, uh, commensurate increase in wealth uh, because of the uh, the older generation has benefited a lot more from the housing reform than the younger generation. So I think that's a. Uh, so actually, I have a. Uh, uh, another research project exploring the role of housing reform uh, in the, uh, as, a, as a form of um, intergenerational wealth transfer, uh, which is what Social Security is doing, right? So China has been growing very rapidly, um, and, uh, and, but you know, uh, uh, presumably the growth, high growth rate will eventually come uh, slow down, right? Or will, 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 de will decrease. Um, pay as you go system. The problem is that when the economy is growing very fast, uh, it's relatively easy to maintain a, pay, a generous pay-as-you-go um, social security system. The only problem is that uh, a generous social security system uh, put in place when the economy is growing very fast may run into problems when the growth rate slows down. Housing, uh, you know, is a form of um, of, uh, of uh, intergenerational wealth transfer uh, that will automatically adjust to the changes in growth rate. So the idea is that you know, in the, when housing reform started in nine, early 1990s, a lot of the, you know, uh, the SOE workers got to purchase their apartments at a very low rate, right? It's like they got the uh, initial uh, IPO of the Chinese housing stocks, right? And these IPOs become floated in 1998 when housing reform, uh, when, when the China uh, uh, opened up the housing market. Housing price appreciated dramatically, just like the IPO shares of a good company will typically appreciate a lot, and that became wealth transferred to the elderly. And, but the, the nice thing about the, the housing price is that it's forward-looking, right? When the economy slows down, uh, the housing price will no longer appreciate as, as fast as it used to be. So uh, in that paper, indeed, we argue that housing, uh, 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 housing can be a really nice way to uh, generate intergeneration, socially wealth, social welfare improving intergenerational wealth, uh, wealth transfer that, does n that can deal with the 
changes in growth rate. Right? So that, so, but uh, that's one thing. But the, your, your question is also related to the idea that, to the, to the issue that maybe a lot of retirement decisions is not a result of them not being able to find jobs. Right? It's a result of them feeling wealthy. They want to retire. Why? Right? You know, if you don't, if you don't, uh, if your house, if your four apartments is worth millions of dollars, why bother to work even if you are just 50? Right? So I would say that uh, this may be true for some of the friends you know, but for mo for the uh, majority of the Chinese population, I think that's probably not uh, uh, the main uh, reason for them not be, to be working. So some of the younger, you know, 50-year-olds who are dancing uh, on the, in the public square, uh, if they could find a job, uh, they, may, they, they probably would still like to work. You also, your, your question is, the labor law seems to would make it very difficult uh, for them to be fired. So um, that's a great question. I, yeah, I have to look more into that. I, I haven't thought much about, um, um, yeah, so I have to think a little bit harder about uh, whether uh, our interpretation that uh, the workers are not working um, because, yeah, so, yeah, I have to think a little more about this, whether it's consistent with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the labor law. Is the labor law very recent? Labor law is re relatively recent, yes. And uh, the other question you have is what will happen to the G down the road? Um, so, um, in the data, recent data, actually, we see an, an increasing level, a uh, higher level of G. Now, eventually, I think uh, it will come down. Uh, we, don't, we, know it, uh, we don't know. We don't have, uh, you know, as I said, the G, the, the intergenerational increase in the human capital uh, is inferred from the cross-sectional wage age profile, right? So, with more data, we can see whether G is slowing down or, or, or accelerating, but right now, uh, uh, um, we haven't seen a science of G coming down. But eventually, I would imagine it will come down. Let's take two more questions. Professor Gao. Yes. Hey. Uh, my question relates back to uh, Sunjin's earlier question about homogeneity. Mm -hmm. We need older people. Yeah. My question is about the homogeneity among the younger generation, uh -huh. right? You assume you calculate this very high G, mm -hmm. uh, which could be translated to that any young person very uh, beautifully, which is not the case in reality. Like somebody who has a college degree from 1995, 2000, 2005, 2015 uh -huh. would be very different in the labor market. Or today, somebody who goes to a 211 right. college yeah. or uh, yeah. 1995 right. yeah. or a very uh, not so great college would be also rewarded very differently. Okay. How can you account for those yeah. variations? Right. And across different right. types of colleges. So I think uh, um, <laughs> heterogeneity is an important issue we'll have to consider in the next version of the paper. Right now, as you can see, the paper is very much a macro style paper. We are assuming representative agents of the youth and representative agents of the old, right? So any kind of heterogeneity within each uh, young youth cohort and the older cohort were ignored, right? So I think, uh, uh, but I think. Uh, um, um, maybe as a first cut, it's useful to see, just compare, uh, to, to kind of consider the averages of each cohort, but richer implications might emerge if we were to incre uh, introduce heterogeneity within each cohort. That's something we haven't done, but we'll, we'll think about it uh, in the next version of the paper. It's a great, great comment. Okay, so who should do the last question? Let's give it to the, the lady Professor, with the microphone. Okay. Yeah. Professor, I do have a follow-up question on the fair wage hypothesis. Yes. Uh, its implication is that a elderly worker would rather go unemployed rather than accepting the lower wage. Is it because of the benefits of their early retirement um, option is higher no. than the lower wage, or is it because their Chinese okay. elderly person is economically irrational? Okay. So this was a behavioral assumption about. Uh, the utility, the preferences of the elderly, elderly worker. So uh, they may tell the firm, the elderly working on model may tell the firm that hire me, I'm willing to work, even if your wage is not uh, very high, okay? 
The problem is that the firm is, 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 anticipates that if a worker is hired at a low wage, uh, an elderly worker is hired at a low, at a low wage, he, will be, he or she will be disgruntled when he or she realizes that his wage is lower than, say, what the younger workers are being paid. Right? When they are disgruntled, they are not going to work putting as much effort as the firm would like. So in other words, the, the elderly worker are not able to commit to putting a certain effort level, even though a priority they may tell the firm that, you know, just hire me, I'm willing to work at a lower wage uh, than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than the prevailing uh, wage. It's not a result of they have a better option to, uh, to uh, do, do they have a, a, a generous uh, pension uh, uh, available to them, right? So here, the, the elderly worker, if they, if they were to able to uh, find a job, they actually uh, the, way, uh, uh, the, the wage is still higher than the average wage they can get. Uh, 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 sorry, average pen the pension they can get uh, in the pension system. So they would like to work, except that there are not enough firms willing to hire them. So that's the, uh, the story. But I didn't get into the details about, uh, about, about how the fair wage hypothesis works in the model. Basically, each worker chooses an effort level that's related to how much they are paid relative to uh, the social average wage. If they, are, if they feel like they're only getting a small fraction relative to the social average wage, they will, their incentive to putting effort will be lower. The firms value those efforts. They, if the worker is hired physically, but they are not putting effort, that worker is not as valuable as a worker who is willing uh, to, be, to be putting more effort. So the firm has to take that into account when they set wages. Excellent. We promised to conclude the event by 7.30, and I want to keep that uh, promise. But before I formally declare a conclusion event, I will let me say that uh, you know, uh, once you retire from the event, there's a retirement benefit in the form of a reception <laughs> outside the room, so you're welcome to enjoy it. So please uh, join me in uh, thanking, uh, and thanking our... Thank you for your